This is very, very exciting. We have our own prophet in the house that's going to be delivering a word, and we're going to get fed. We've been getting fed every day. So Patrick and I have been excited. We've been coming back every day, every night, every morning, and even getting up for prayer in the morning. I ask you to join us because it's been amazing. Yeah. Are you excited? I'm super excited. I can't wait to, uh, can't wait to hear what Prophet Arky has to say. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here's the announcement. Welcome, Citadel family. We're so glad you're here with us. Welcome to Prophetic Conference 2024, Freedom Unleashed. Soar into a new beginning. Inspired by Isaiah 61 verse one. We invite you to step out of the enemy's camp and into the freedom and fresh beginnings God has prepared for you. This weekend, get ready for powerful prophetic teachings, dynamic worship, and a vibrant community of believers eager to encounter God in a life-changing way. Whether you've been walking with God for years or are just starting your journey, this is your moment to break free from spiritual bondage and soar into your divine destiny. Let's dive into what's happening this October. At the Citadel, community is at the core of who we are, and we have some amazing opportunities for you to stay connected. Middle and high schoolers, join us every Thursday at 7 p.m. for Word Youth. This is your space to connect, have fun, and grow in your relationship with God and each other. Men of Citadel, don't miss Kingdom Men on the first Saturday of every month. It's a time for personal growth, learning, and bonding with other men on a similar journey. Ladies, we've got hearts on fire every first Saturday at 11 a.m. It's all about encouragement, connection, and spiritual growth. Start your day off right with morning prayer. Join us on Zoom every weekday from 5.30 to 6.30 a.m. as we seek God together and set the tone for the day in His presence. And here's what's coming up. This Sunday, Charles Harkey will be with us for a powerful service. And this coming Wednesday, Pastor Rob Lester will be preaching. Looking ahead to November 5th and 6th, we'll be hosting two nights of healing with Prophet John Harkey. These are going to be unforgettable nights. So invite your friends and family to experience God's healing power firsthand. At the Citadel, we're all about building strong connections. Whether you're seeking a prophetic word, a place to belong, or a community to journey with, we're here for you. Don't do life alone. Welcome home. Amen. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you again, worship team. That was awesome. That was powerful. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That was, uh, thank you, Patrick and Sarah. That was wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Great, great trenches. And it, it's so good to have you all here tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise God. How, is there anybody here your first time? Want to greet you if you are visiting or you, or you already hear <laughs> the sound booth? Anyway, aren't you blessed for with, with what God had been doing the word last night? Amen. The word this morning. My goodness was amazing, was powerful. Yeah. And I wanted to, I have the opportunity, the privilege to talk about the offering again tonight. And some of you may say, oh my gosh, why are we taking offering again? Didn't we pay for it? Didn't we register? <laughs> we already registered. Why do we have to take an offering? Let me say, let me put it this way. Listen, our registration it's not even worthy for the word of God that we receive. It's not even good enough, amen, for the word of God that he has imparted to us last night, this morning, and tonight again, and tomorrow morning. So I am just so blessed, so excited. I, I just have to tell you guys the truth. John and I were in Hawaii last, e uh, last month. I know I shared here before last month, and we have been doing this conference every year. I think about the last 15 years or longer. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this year, we have to open the conference in uh, Maui. It's two conferences going at the same time. Prophetic conference. One going on in Maui, one going on in uh, Oahu, and same speaker, they fly us back and forth. So John opened the conference, and I look at the, the price. I mean, look at, I saw how much they charge it. Because some of our people here went to the conference, 
And I saw the price, it was $250 per person. <laughs> and I saw the, for, for a family, it was $750 per family. And listen, there were 2,000 people in Maui registered to, uh, to go to the conference, and 1,000 people in Oahu. Let me tell you what, these people, they value God's word. Amen? Because they know, he, what is his word says? Man can live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We desperately need the word of God. We can put a price tag on the word of God. Amen? I love what my husband said with the registration. It just so we know the count, <laughs> how many it's go, is uh, attending at the conference. I just want to make sure I uh, uh, say this. My husband said it this morning in case uh, he forget. Everyone that registered to the, for the conference tomorrow morning, we're starting at 830. And he's going to speak, and Pastor Steve is going to speak also. And right after the, the message, we are going to prophesy on everyone that have registered. Amen? So make sure you be here, hear the word, and we want that to make sure we prophesy on all of you, those, especially those that, that uh, prophesy. So anyway, getting back how much we need the word of God. All I can think of remembering when there was a famine in the land. You can find the story in the book of Genesis, chapter 42, in 43 there were famine in the land and Jacob and his entire family were caught up in a famine and they heard that there were bread in Egypt they heard there were bread over there they can get food from there listen I pray that people will hear there is bread at the two at, 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 at uh, Citadel Church, Amen. My prayer is that people—I mean, famine—that means people don't get to hear the word of God. I know we we got the privilege to travel all over the world, all over the the country. We got the the joy and the privilege of sharing God's word in these churches. But I know there are call it church, but the word of God. People still live their lifestyle, not receiving and allowing the word of God into their life, their life to change them. For me, man, you're living in famine when you are not feasting from the word of God. So anyway, they heard that there is famine, and they, but uh, there is famine in the land, but they heard there is bread in Egypt. So Jacob sent his, his uh, sons over there to go get bread from them. Because it is so important. Listen, you can't survive. You can't survive. I mean, physically, from food. And spiritually, we need the word of God. We desperately need the word of God. So that's why he sent his sons over there to go get the food. So guess what happened? When they got there, they found out who is in charge. Was their own brother. Was their own brother that they have sold. And so they gave them the money to get food. And I, I was in my mind, Joseph saw and he knew right away, that's their brother. They are living in famine. And guess what? He loaded, put food on their sacks, sent them back. And guess what he did? He put back their money. He put back the money they brought, put it back in their sack and sent it back. I can just picture God saying to us, hey, I'll eat the money that we gave them. God already know. We desperately need him. Amen. We need him more than the money. That's why Joseph and God show me, hey, Meliana, you need me more than what you can give me. Your money, whatever you can give me, you need me more. And, that, and that when I saw the story of Joseph, Joseph gave, gave them back the money. I don't need it. <laughs> You need your whole, I mean, my brother, you are my family. I need all of you guys to be here 
because you desperately need what God has given me. God has sent me ahead so I can be a blessing for the entire family. And God is saying this for some of us tonight. We need God more than anything else. Amen? And listen to it. So they left, and but Joseph told them, hey, I don't want you ever to come back. Then he found out. Of course, Joseph know about his brother, Benjamin. So he told his brother, I don't want you to show up here again until you bring your little brother with you. That God showed me, listen, God will use all of us to save our family. Amen? That we need to know why we are here at the Citadel. Why we know God. Why? Because God wants to use you to save your family. Amen? To save your friends. And that's what Joseph did. I don't want you to come back. He, of course, he was playing with his brother. His brother didn't even know, didn't even know that that was Joseph. That was their own brother. Listen, sometimes we don't recognize. God will send deliverance into our midst. But sometimes we're so blind, we can't see what God's doing in our lives. So we need to pray, ask God, God, open my eyes to see what you are doing in my midst, that you have sent me into your presence. You have blessed me so much, and I am responsible to save my whole family. I am responsible to save South Tucson. Why? Because God will so fill you with his word. Amen? He will so bless you with who he is and what he has given you. Of course, we all know his, we all know the rest of the story. They brought Jacob over there, the brother. Finally, uh, when they brought a uh, uh, little Benjamin, J uh, Joseph could not handle. He revealed himself, who he is, to his brothers. And then, not only that, he told them, go back and get my father. And I want all of you here to enjoy what God is doing in my life. I am going to provide for you and your entire family. Listen, God wants to prosper you, bless you in every area of your life. Amen? So you can be a source of a blessing for your entire family. Listen, if we love our family, we will love God. We will obey God. So God can use you and I to bring deliverance for our entire family, not only our entire family, for our city, for our state, for our nation, and the whole earth. And that's what Joseph did. Amen? I want to read the scripture that I was so blessed with last night when uh, Pastor Steve uh, sharing that word of uh, when we bring offering to him. It's found in the book of him. I went up to him and asked him, what, what, where was it again, the scripture? And he reminded me it was on Genesis chapter 8. If you were not here last night, you need to see uh, Pastor Rob. Maybe he can send you the link because I am going to rewatch that message. That was a powerful word. Okay, I'm going to read that, that part, uh, that verse that was blessed me with last night. Genesis chapter 8, I mean chapter 8, verse 20. And all the way to 22, and it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and take some of all the clean animals and clean birds. He sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never, <coughs> never again will I curse the ground because of humans, ever, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. I'm going to go on to verse 22. As long as the earth endures seed times and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, Day and night will never cease. When I heard him uh, spoke about this, I learned what Noah did. He brought the best. He brought.
brought the best to sacrifice for what the Lord have done. He did not bring leftover. He said, bring the best, the cleanest. He says, he says, bring the cleanest animals and green birds and sacrifice a burnt offering to him. Listen, why Noah call it a sacrifice? Because it hurt when we take another offering after we already register. You know? <laughs> it's hurt. That's why it's called sacrifice. <laughs> and why it's called sacrifice? Because we take too many offerings. <laughs> but listen, I, I live a lifestyle of a sacrifice. I am just so blessed. Yeah, yeah. I just said again. I sacrificed so much. We didn't even have to take a paycheck from the church. We started it about three years ago. I just delighted doing what God called me to do. Yeah. He blessed us so much. Why? Because I choose to sacrifice. So my son, he come here since we started opening the Sunday morning. Some of you know he come sometimes twice a month or once a month, even brought his wife with him. Guess what? That church don't even pay their ticket, their rental car, anything. Why? Because I encourage them, live a lifestyle of sacrifice to him and watch. God will bless you. God will prosper you. God will supply all your needs. And guess what? I was so blessed. When we got home, he showed me a picture while he's here ministering. They're moving to their home, new place, beautiful home. So his little wife is over there packing. Some people from their church is helping them to move while he's here sacrificing, <laughs> while he's here serving. But he was uh, showing me what the Lord have done, you know, what the Lord have done, the house and they are having. And I said, God, thank you. We can outgive. We can outgive what you're doing in our lives. And that's why I don't mind sharing about taking an offering. Why? Because I want you to enjoy and be a source of a blessing to your children, to your family, and everyone you come in contact with. Amen. Yes. Become a Joseph. Be a Joseph to your family. Be a Joseph to everyone you come in contact with. Amen. And that's what Noah did. God, you have done so much in my life. I'm going to sacrifice the best. I'm going to give you the best because of all that you have done for me, how you rescue me. And listen, he said, God, when God saw the, the, and the Lord says, I smelled it. I smell what you did because I saw you did not have enough, <laughs> but you give it. You gave it in an offering. You gave it because we want to buy, the, the, uh, we wanted to uh, put, put a fence and all that. We are, built, we are uh, prophesying we're going to start more campuses. We are not collecting money for so we can live a, a, some kind of lifestyle. Listen, God have called you and I to be a Joseph to this neighborhood. Amen? Amen. So, and he said, the Bible said that the Lord smelled it as a pleasing aroma. And he said he made a covenant. God made a covenant in his heart. And he said, never again I will curse South Tucson. <laughs> never again. You know my heart breaks every time I drive in, seeing the neighborhood, seeing the homeless people. And I, and I pray our sacrifice, God will look down. Never again I will heal South Tucson. Because you and I become a Joseph to this area. Amen. And he said, never again. And he said, because of humans, even though 
every inclination of human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures. My prayer, when I see all those people, men and women, sitting around, smoking, I pray, oh God, heal them and deliver them. Read verse, verse uh, 22 again. As long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, golden heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. This is what I received when I read that verse. God is showing this. His blessing will not only be just a one time. It is not going to just happen one time. Many of us, because sometimes we, 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 we try to obey. We, we try to obey God and do what he asks us to do. Next month, something happened. Problem, crisis happened. But I, I believe God is saying, when you and I obey him, he will see to it that our lives will continue to be a blessing every day, day in and day out, not just a one-time deal. Amen? And that's the kind of God we serve. He's a God that he's faithful to his word. He's a God that will supply all our needs. And he will on always continue to provide seed for us. And we will always, in harvest time, in every day of our lives, there will always, God will always be there to supply all our needs. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Okay, if you have your offering, we have a QR code right there. You can download the Church, church Center app, and you can choose the Citadel. There's only one Citadel Church here in Tucson. Or if you want to text or go on our website, the Citadel Church, or if you want to write a check or um, give cash, you can raise your hand. We can also will give you an envelope so we can give you your uh, giving record at the end of the month for your tax. Amen? Okay, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray, oh God, that may you receive what we give to you, oh God. Lord, I know that you don't need our money as we have learned in Joseph. He saw that his brothers desperately need the supply, desperately need food. That's why you gave it back to them. But you wanted the whole, he wanted the whole entire family to be blessed. And that's why he told his brother to go get his little brother and the entire family and their father. Why? To live in the abundance. Father, you have chosen us. You have set us apart. We have tasted and see that the Lord is good. Lord, I pray, oh God, that tonight as we give, many of us are given sacrificially, oh God. Lord, I pray that may you be, may you be pleased that it will be a sweet smelling to you, oh God, as your people sacrifice. I pray, oh God, that you bless them, you reward them. Let them, oh God, become a Joseph for their family. Wherever you place them, oh God, that means they will not only become a blessing financially, they will be a source of peace when there is chaos around them. They will speak forth your word, and storm will die. Lord, I pray again, they will be a source of love when there is hatred. Lord, I pray, oh God, that, that you use your people tonight, oh God. You bless them. You prosper them. May you say the same word that you said to Noah, oh God. Never again, never again. South Tucson will be cursed. The people that we see along the street, they will be delivered from drugs. We speak healing and we speak deliverance, oh God, over South Tucson. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are using the citadel to be a place of bread. That the people will hear there is bread here at the citadel church. And they will come here, oh God, to receive your word. Help us, oh God, to realize what a blessing, what a privilege to be a source of blessing. Father, we thank you. We love you. We adore you. 
thank you for hearing our prayer. Again, bless your people as they give. Prosper them. Protect over them. Give them great health. Lord, your blessing is not only material things. Your blessing will come in a form of restore relationship. Will come in a form of healing in a body when we needed it. Your blessing will come in peace and joy. Salvation to family members. Healing to family members. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, ushers. Praise God. Go ahead. Uh, Lord, there's amen. nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. No, no. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Can we all stand? Better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's nothing. Sing it out. So there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Hallelujah. I want you to lift your hands all over the house right now. Father, we thank you, Father, for your power here. We thank you for what you're going to do, Father, in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of prophecy rest in this room. In the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Charles, just stay up here, you and Nimsey and Annabella, for a moment. I'd like to invite uh, Prophet Michael and Pastor Steve up to the platform. I want to do something in a moment. This is a prophetic conference, and this is a prophetic church, and we prophesy. How many believe in the power of the prophetic word? Come on, how many believe in the power of the prophetic word? Calvin, I'd like you to stand up, please. I'd like you to come up to the front here. Congregation, I want you to stretch forth your hands to Calvin right now. You know, um, when I seen you when you were coming, I felt the glory of God in you. But I also, he, he showed me a little bit about your life. It was like you're, you've been looking for answers. You've been looking, trying to find for answers. And you've been hurting. It's like God... I need you. I need you. But then I seen the glory behind you. And he says, son, I've been with you at all times. When you thought that this was not going to work, it did work. Because it was me that did it. But the Lord says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you because you have a word in you that the Lord has put in you. And you're going to release it. You, you, the Lord's going to use you, even at your age. He's going to use him at that age. But you're saying, how? How? He says, don't worry, because I am going to lead you. And when, the time, and everything. Not only that, he says, because you're going to sacrifice. I have a job for you. A job that you thought that you were not qualified. I have a job perfect for you made that is going to bless you financially. You're not even going to worry what, how you're going to make it, how you're going to pay. And people are going to look at you and say, how is he making it? But you do know, you're going to know 
wh why are you making it? Because it is God that is going to be with you, and he's going to bless you, and he's going to guide you. And I, already, I see like a, a wisdom just falling in, in, in you right now. I just see his glory of wisdom right now. But the Lord is going to bless you mighty, big. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Start getting your baskets. Start getting your bu buckets. Start getting everything, whatever, because you don't want to miss what God has for you, says the Lord. Father, touch him, Lord Jesus. Touch him, Lord. Give God a shout of praise right now. Give God a shout of praise. Uh, Alicia, would you, would you stand up? Would you come over here, Alicia? Yes, yes, would you come over here? Would you come over here? Is Karina here? Is Karina here? She's not here. Okay, praise Jesus. Let's go over to Pastor Steve. Would you come over here? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to come down here with you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, there's a... Uh, story in the Bible. It's just a real short story. And it's about a man, a man that caused a lot of pain. His name was Jabez. Just a blip in the Bible. But he says to the Lord, he says, Lord, I don't want to cause any more pain, but I want you to bless me. The reason I tell you that story is because there's been pain in your life. You've had much pain. You've had many disappointments. You've had many people let you down. But the Lord was saying, there's no more pain, only blessings. And, and what I, I specifically heard the Lord say in, in not just financially, but in relationally, relationship, there's... There, there's, there, there's relationships that have been um, severed or, or been, um, you know, you haven't spoken to some people in a while. And the Lord would say that I'm giving you the ministry of reconciliation. And those, those opportunities to, to reconcile, those opportunities to come along beside those that have have, and it's not because it was a bad thing. It's just because it was just relationally you just separated yourself. But the Lord says, I'm bringing back reconciliation to your family, to your life, but also to your family, to your children, and, and to all those around you. Amen. And so understand this. I, I, I said it last night. And I, I just briefly said it last night. The pain that... that you have felt was not for naught, if you know what I'm talking about. In, in other words, God used that pain for his glory. And he is going, on this, on this side of what you have felt, what you have, have seen, I, I, what I literally saw just now as I was speaking to you, I saw a door open and close, and you were on the other side of the door. In other words, he said, he said, I want you to know, I want you to tell my daughter that this door in your life is closing and I'm taking you to a new place. And it's a place of joy. Amen? It's a place of joy. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. He says, I'm bringing the joy back to your life. You're going to get your groove back. Come on. You're going to get your joy back your peace back right here your peace back because you think a lot so father in the name of Jesus let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard her heart and mind in Christ Jesus father God 
Father, I pray right now, Father God, this door that, that, that was open to be shut, Father God. And as she walks into this new place, God, that revelation, wisdom, and knowledge, Father God, would flow like a river. God, that the joy of the Lord will be her strength, Father God. That the joy would, Father God, just build up inside of her, God, where people will see the joy and, God, be drawn to the joy in her life, God, because she is a mighty woman of God, Father. I thank you for the ministry of reconciliation in her life, God. I thank you, Father God, for our dear sister, God. I thank you for the blessing that she is to the body of Christ and the blessing that she is to the rest of her family, God. We love you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stretch forth your hands to her right now, please. Just lift your hands, Alicia. I, just lift your hands to Jesus, Alicia, right now. I, when, when Pastor Steve was prophesying over you, I... I, 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 I felt like I had to, I have to do something. That the enemy has tried to attack you for the last seven years with the spirit of fear. And what God is going to do right now is he's going to deliver you tonight. And, and what's going to happen is, because it's, it's even where you, you, you would isolate yourself. And what would happen is your mind would run wild, even though you would pray, even though you would cry out. And if something was said, some little thing, it would shut you down. And the Lord says, I, I didn't call you to be shut down. I called to open you up like a treasure chest. Because there's a treasure inside you. There's a treasure inside of you, daughter. And the Spirit of God would say, I want my treasure. I want my treasure back. I want my treasure back. And people who have been insensitive and who have misunderstood you or, not, or, or shut you down have said, don't do that, don't do that. But the Lord says, I give you permission to display the treasure that I placed in you. Father, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, touch your daughter right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There it is. God is touching you right now. Jesus. There it is. Hallelujah. 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 Come on and give God a shout of praise right now. Give God a shout of praise. 16 years ago. 16 years ago. Because I went over and asked Charles. I was in a tent revival. My son Charles had just got married to his beautiful wife, Maddie. He was singing the song. I've asked him to sing the song because what happened that night is I gave an altar call and they came up to the front and then it was like a wave of power hit them. And people were slain all over, all over the tent with nobody laying hands on them. That night, I, I, I then was over on my right at the end of the tent, and there was a gentleman standing on the far left across the tent. One of the ushers got me and uh, asked me if I would go over to pray for him. I go over to pray for him, and, I, and, and the Lord speaks to me. And this is what he says, Michael. He says, I want you to put him on your shoulder, and I want you to spin him around. Now, he's a pretty big guy. And I was about 30 or 40 pounds lighter than I was. Come on. It was on YouTube. Someone put it on YouTube. So, you know, I have to obey the Lord. I have to obey the Lord. So, I, so, so Larry, I do the football thing, and I... Pick him up. I don't even know how I picked him up. I just picked him up. He felt like a feather. And I laid him on my right shoulder. And I spun him around. And Charlie was singing the song he's going to sing in just a few moments. And all of a sudden, I let him go. And whether he fell out because he was dizzy or the spirit, I didn't know. But he fell out. Well, you know, Meliana thought our career in ministry was over. Come on. <laughs> we're done because we were leaving. We were leaving, Pastor Steve, that, 
that, that next morning to Hawaii, you know. And so I guess a few days went by, and I, I got a phone call from the pastor. He said, Brother Harkey, you know that guy you spun? I go, oh, no. He laid there for six hours. He was a youth pastor of Assembly of God Church there in, there in Idaho. And when he finally got up, the guy that was, the guy that had, had, his, had his fifth wheel watching the tent and everything, said he testified. For the last 17 years, he'd been suffering from vertigo. When he got up, he was completely healed. Come on. Come on and give God a shout of praise. Give God a shout of praise. We are entering a season of seeing unusual miracles. We need somebody to obey God. Somebody to obey God. For a few years after that, you know, because it was on YouTube, there were several thousand hits on that. And uh, I would get calls from pastors. Said, Brother Harkey, I need you to spin one of my board members. Can you spin, can you spin one of my members of my church? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not doing that, you know. Who knows, I may spin tonight, who knows. <laughs> but here's what we're going to do. There's a God that loves South Tucson. And I have to tell you something. that There are people walking around this street in an emotional vertigo, in a, in a spiritual vertigo, in a bubble. They don't know their right hand from their left. And I'm here to tell you right now, this is a house of deliverance. It's a house of healing. It's a house of miracles. And God is raising up men and women that are going after God, that walk in power and walk in anointing and walk in glory. So I'm just going to ask you to do one more thing for me before I preach the word tonight. I want everyone to stand right now. And I want you to sing that song with Charles. Kim Walker sang it. It was years ago. I think it was 2009. So, it, oh, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. 15, 16 years ago. I still remember. I, uh, Charles and Maddie were so young. You know, <laughs> they had just gotten married, and all of a sudden, but yet the power of God is still the same power that was there in that tent is in this room. I can sense it tonight. I can sense it tonight. I can sense it tonight. Go ahead, son. Just lift your hands, congregation. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Yeah, he loves us. He loves South Tucson. Oh, how he loves He loves this city. Us. Oh, how he loves He loves us. this people. Oh, how he loves us. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, I want you to grab the shoulder of the person there and put your hand on their shoulder. I want you to pray for the person on your left and the person on your right. 
that the love of Jesus would so saturate them. That they would be immersed in the love of Jesus. Their hearts would burn. There would be a hunger for God's word, a hunger for God's presence, a hunger for fellowship. But all of a sudden, they would be immersed in Jesus. I wanted to give up all just to follow him. God, I lift up my neighbor on my left. I lift up my neighbor on my right. And I, I ask you in the name of Jesus, there would be an impartation of the love of God. Because it takes God to love God. That, Father, you would, you, you would give us tonight. You would, you would give this congregation and everyone within the sound of my voice. Father, I ask you for this one. I ask you for this one thing. That you would give this congregation this gift. That the same love you have for the Son, you would give it to us. You would give it to us tonight. That we would love Jesus like the Father loves Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Tell two people, you look like you're filled with the love of God. Come on, tell two people that. You're filled with the love of God. The love of God. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to begin to unpack something that the Lord laid on my heart. This particular, this particular word that God has given me, I've been brewing on it for the last few weeks, not just a day or two, but the last few weeks. Over the course of my walk with Jesus, I, I have to say something to you. I have not been a student of Revelation, but about a month ago, a month and a half ago, because it's now middle of October, Pastor Steve, I felt like the Spirit of God tell me, I want you to dive into the book of Revelation. Not so much that I could find out what the future holds, but so I could get a deeper revelation of Jesus. Because I think that sometimes what happens is we get caught up in the beast. We get caught up in 666. We get caught up in an election. We get caught up in what's going on in Israel or what's happening on the news. And we forget that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus. Because we can have all these wonderful words about, about Noah and the ark, about, uh, about, the, about the new wine and all that we've heard about what if. But if we do not have a revelation of Jesus... Because we can, we can have a five-fold ministry and we can have all, all of those things, great worship and great preaching. But if we do not have a revelation of Jesus, we are missing. And the book of Revelation in a nutshell is just this. Jesus is coming back as conquering king, destroying the works of the devil. Destroying the false prophet and all that doesn't line up with scripture, he will conquer. And because I'm a saint, come on, do I have any saints in the house? Do I got any saints in the house? Because I'm a saint, I'm on his side. But there's a verse of scripture that I want to read because this, I, I, when the Lord spoke this to me in Hawaii, I began to weep. It's going to take me a few minutes to get there, but I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Because I want to set a stage of where I'm going. Because John, the apostle, the prophet, the one that leaned on the breast of the Lord, the one that wrote the book of Revelation, is writing this, and this is where he says he is. In verse 9, I'm going to read from the NIV tonight. And it says, I, John, your brother and companion in suffering 
and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos. Everybody say the island of Patmos. Let me tell you where John is writing from. He's not writing from a hotel room in Honolulu overlooking the harbor. Come on. He's not riding from a mountaintop overlooking a beautiful view. He's not riding, riding on in front of the Ohio River in a, in a hotel room as big as this, this church. Come on. He's in exile, ladies and gentlemen. He's in exile. Everybody say exile. But John does something to you and I. He, he teaches me something. I hope he will teach you the same thing. He teaches me how to sing in exile. He teaches me how to worship in exile because sometimes in life we find ourselves in exile. I understand that there's a self-imposed exile. I, I must tell you that many of the, of the people walking the streets of South Tucson, many of them are self-imposed exile. Not all of them, but some of them are self-imposed in their exile. Are, are you, oh, they find the YouTube, come on, of me spinning. Don't, don't put that up, Mark, come on. Okay, okay. Look at Charles, he looks... I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> no more stories. He's on the island of Patmos. He's in exile. You know, we talked about Wednesday going in the valley. Last night we were on the mountain. Tonight we're in exile. But exile can be self-imposed. For instance, I honestly believe this. There are a number of people that are walking the streets of South Tucson tonight are in exile because they have made poor choices. But in John's case, he's not in, his, his exile is not self-imposed. He was placed in it by the Roman government. The Roman government wanted to shut him down. The Roman government did not want him to preach. The Roman government did not want him to talk about Jesus or testify about Jesus. But what John tells me, Meliana, is this. That because I'm in the spirit, and because I belong to God, and because I'm a child of God, there is no geographical location that can hold me. There is no environment that can hold me. There is no government that can hold me. There is no devil that can hold me. There is no chain that can hold me. That I have been unleashed because I'm a man of the spirit. Come on. In the natural, I may be in exile. As far as the government concerned, I may be shut off in isolation, but when it comes to the Spirit of God, there is no exile. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Oh, come on. And because I'm, my name is John, that's what I was named after him. Come on. I don't have to allow my exile we all, because cancer could have pinned me down. 
Come on. Financial problems can pin you down. A bad marriage can pin you down. A loss of job can put you in exile. But ladies and gentlemen, just because I'm in exile doesn't mean I shut up. Just because I'm in exile doesn't mean I stop prophesying. Just because I'm in exile doesn't mean I stop singing. Just because I'm in exile doesn't mean I stop worshiping. Just because I'm in exile doesn't mean I, I get bitter. Just because I'm in exile doesn't mean I quit. What When I'm in exile, I tell exile, guess who's in charge? Not my circumstances. Not my situation. Not what's been done to me. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. He was in exile. He's on the island of Patmos. Because why? Because of the word of God? Well, if God, if you're good, why would you put me in exile? If you're good, why am I here on this island? How can I be effective in this place? I can no longer advance. How come you put me in South Tucson? Let me, let, me, let me tell you something right now. There are moments when I have to be honest with you. I felt like South Tucson. I was being exiled. <laughs> Why didn't you start a church in a nicer community? <laughs> Come on. You can't even speak Spanish, boy. <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? Why do you start it? But see, sometimes the Lord will put you in exile because it's in that exile he wants to give you a revelation. He wants you to give you a revelation of who he is, what he's going to do in the future, and what is happening in present. Why would you leave Hawaii? I'm in exile because of the word of God, which means I'm not in exile because of the Roman government. I'm not in exile because of Nero. I'm not in exile because of the law. I'm in exile for the word of God. And you know what I'm, because it's God that puts me here, I'm going to be fruitful in the middle of my circumstances. Because ladies and gentlemen, I've learned something in my 62 years of life that my fruitfulness is not determined by my circumstance. My fruitfulness is determined by my mindset. And when my mindset is right and I see things in right perspective, then guess what? I'm going to bear fruit wherever I am. Whether I'm in South Tucson or in Beverly Hills. Whether I'm in Hawaii or Galesburg. I'm still going to bear fruit because my fruit is not determined by circumstances because I am speaking the word of the Lord. Listen, he said, because of the word of the Lord and the testimony of Jesus. And it sets the stage. But see, John also is this. John is also a pastor. He's the head apostle of seven churches that he addresses. And he's still preaching why he's in exile. Let me just tell you, I've seen preachers find themselves in exile and quit the ministry. Because the people leave. There's not enough money. We ran out of money. Closed the church down. You know what they're well, you know what they are saying? My exile is determining my calling. My pain does not determine my calling. He didn't he didn't like it, but it didn't stop him. Because the spirit goes beyond my circumstances. And so, because he loves the churches, he's still going to preach, he's still going to equip, he's still going to believe, he's still going to prophesy, he's still going to see in the middle of the exile. But I also want to tell you this. I don't have time tonight to address all the churches. I would like to, but maybe there might be a day that I might. 
but because of time's sake and because of where I believe the Spirit of God wants me, I'm going to address one church. Because I have to break a stronghold in this area. As a prophet of God, I have to break a stronghold. I have to call it out in the atmosphere. Because, I, because we can prophesy about what God wants to do here. I mean, just as we pull in the mirror, this may be a mega church. Are you hearing what I mean? A mega church over a thousand. Come on. Why? Why? Because I believe that God has a vision. God has a call for this place. Come on. But, but, but we, we, God can, that can be on God's heart. But if we don't do God, God, things God's way, come on. We can prophesy till we're blue in the face. But if we don't do it God's way, because I can say, oh, God, give me a mega church. Give me, give me everything. I, I can have the best leadership team on the planet. But if I don't do it God's way, there's a way of success. There's a way of doing things. You know what? It said that Israel knew God's deeds, but Moses knew God's ways. You notice the one that, the one that knew God's ways is the one that saw him face to face. The one that knew God's ways didn't get offended at God. The one that knew God's ways didn't backslide. Come on. When a the, when the whole camp rebelled. Are you hearing me? When, when the one that knew God's ways was crying out for the rebellious. Come on. When they were running around in a calf, he wasn't joining them. He wasn't quitting the ministry. The one that knew God's ways when God said, I want to destroy them and start a nation with you, said, God, don't do that. Save those people. Come on. Save. Because he knows God's ways. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, excuse me, Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Very familiar, very familiar. It's the last church that God addresses through the apostle John, through the prophet. Just a little information for you that every, every other six, every other church Every, six others, there are seven together. Every one of them, God said something encouraging about them. Except this one. Except this church. And you have to see this because I'm going to read out the NIV and it says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen." The faithful and true witness. How many want to hear the words of the, those that are, who, is, who is faithful and true? The ruler of God's creation is Jesus. Listen to what he says here. I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, why? I mean, we've had every word up to this point has really been encouraging, preacher. But now you're addressing the church of Laodicea. And I'll tell you why, ladies and gentlemen, because there's something called emotion. You and I cannot be sustained by emotion. We're sustained by covenant and commitment which bypasses emotion. Because I'm going to talk about something right now in the next couple of minutes that is so crucial for every one of us here. How many want to see every prophetic word that's been spoken over this church come to pass? I can tell you how it come to pass. Passion is crucial. You have to have passion. Because, you know, what gets me up in the morning is passion. What, what, what gets me on a plane from South Africa to Indiana to back to Tucson and, and excited about coming to church, come on, is not the size of the crowd. It, it, it's not the offering. It's passion, ladies and gentlemen. What, 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 I mean, my body wanted to take a nap this afternoon. But what got me up from my nap what was not how many people are going to show up on a Friday night. It was passion. Passion keeps me going. A passion for God. Come on. Because we live in a day and age when there's been so much spiritual passivity. 
spiritual passivity. And spiritual passivity is demonstrated by the lack of level of commitment and participation in what God is doing. I know your deeds. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one. Which means, because if you were cold, I could light a fire in you. If you were hot, I would join you. Oh, come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But if you're neither one, you don't know what you are. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't have an identity. You don't, you don't have a purpose. Passion is crucial. It's so crucial, ladies and gentlemen, that there was a woman whose daughter was demon-possessed. And you know what happened to her? She, at every step of the way, she was resistant. The, the church wanted to kick her out. The disciples wanted to send her home. Jesus calls her a dog. But her passion, her passion for her daughter's deliverance, her passion for her daughter's healing, her passion for seeing the power of God demonstrated in her life overwhelmed her emotions and how she was mistreated. Passion is crucial. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, now, here's something very interesting. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I read that, I, I, I honestly believe that the American church doesn't know what they're doing. The last thing I want is God to spit me out of my mouth. That I don't like your life because what you're doing is not pleasing me. Oh, you're hearing me. I'm not ready to spit you out. When you spit something out, why do you spit something out? Because it don't taste good. You spit it out because you don't want it. You vomit it out. One time I say, I vomit you out. Why would he say such a thing? Because your lack of passion isn't how I have called you to live. I want you to live with passion. I want you to, I want, I want you to wake up in the morning. I get to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and I get to pray. I have a passion to pray. Because if I don't have a passion to pray, if I don't have a passion to witness, if I don't have the passion to worship, then something is wrong on the inside. Because we live in a day and age, we have a passion for sex. We have a passion for entertainment. We have a passion for vacation. We have a passion for food. We have a passion for mocha heke. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you... But do we have a passion for what God has a passion for? I'm titling this message based on one phrase, one statement out of verse 17. It's, that, it's two words, Pastor Steve. It says, you say. Turn to your neighbor and say, you say. He didn't say, I said. You said. What does that mean? That's a self-assessment. And I, I know something about self-assessment. Most self-assessments are incorrect. Because it doesn't matter about my self-assessment, about my condition. Or the condition of somebody else's heart. What matters is what God says. Not what you say, not what I say. What does God say? Because what does God say? He's the faithful and true witness. Come on. We're human beings. We're fallible. We, 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 we embellish. We, we have weaknesses. We like people to like us. You know, God says, says the truth whether you like it or not. And, and basically what the church of Latio is saying, you say. Now, now, they was making a self-assessment about their spiritual condition. And here, here's the thing, and this is what, I, what, what I've realized that sometimes we don't make the right assessment because we don't want to hurt anybody. 
we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or they might leave the church or they may not like us or they may not give in the offering if I say something like that. You say, I am rich and have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Church, let me just tell you. No matter how, I, how many people I've spun, no matter how many things I've seen God do, I'm not rich. I haven't acquired the wealth that he's talking about. I'm not in a place where I don't need anything. I'm in a place of need right now. I need him. I need his power. I need his presence. I need his peace. I need his, I need his, I need his anointing. I need his grace on my life. I need him. I'm never so rich that I don't need him anymore. Oh, come on. I'd like to meet you. You're richer than Jesus. I haven't met anybody richer than Jesus in my life. Uh, I, I, I haven't met somebody that's so prosperous. I, I'm more prosperous than God. But, but, but church, I'm going to tell you, some people live like they're, they know more than God. They act like they know more than God. They make decisions like they know more than God. But guess what? There's an awakening coming. There's an awakening coming. Because though, those that obey God are going to experience revival. The Citadel Church is going to experience a revival. Are you hearing? We're going to experience revival. We're going to experience an awakening in our heart. We're going to be men and women that worship with passion. We're going to be men with witness with passion, serve with passion, pray with passion, give with passion. Because we're, we're going to declare war on the spirit of passivity. Because let me just tell you, the reason why the church in Tucson, the condition that it's in is not because of the pew, but because of the pulpit. I'm here to tell you to declare war on passivity behind the pulpit. God is raising up men and women like Pastor Veronica Acosta, like Sarah McFarland, like Rob Lester, like Prophet Michael Sanchez. That this was, you don't know what you just gave me. You gave me permission to decree the word of the Lord. You gave me permission. I'm a man of passion. I know where I came from. I know where I came out of. I shouldn't be alive right now. I shouldn't be married right now. I should be divorced. I should be on drugs. I should be in prison. I should be homeless. But something happened. Something happened 40 years ago that hasn't left me yet. No, I am not rich. Oh, look at Harky's lifestyle. I am not rich. The moment that I think I'm rich, I, I, I begin to say, God, I don't need you. I can't buy a healing. I can't buy a miracle. Let me just tell you something. People with money are going to come in here that don't even come they don't want to come to the south side because they don't cross over 22nd Street. They're going to come to this church. Why? Because the real riches, the real riches is a revelation of Jesus, the healer, the deliverer, the savior. You say you are rich. And, and sometimes we say it by, I don't need to obey God. I don't need to obey, obey God. No. I need to obey God. But do not you realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? What is Jesus doing? He's diagnosing the condition not to leave them there. Not to leave them in that condition. Would you want a doctor that you're dying with cancer to tell you you don't have cancer? If you had something wrong with your body, would you want the 
the, the doctor, and, and, they, and they had the cure. They, they had the necessary medication to give you so that you would be healed. You, you would want him to, oh, you're going to be okay. You're okay. That's malpractice. There are preachers preaching malpractice. There are Christians living malpractice out because they're worried about offending somebody. And no wonder the, the, the people was in that condition. The, the doctor would be sued. Telling the person when they when they saw the x-ray and the mass on their lungs and they said, nah, 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 you're okay. And they had the ability to treat it and cure it. Jesus doesn't practice malpractice. He's the great physician. And he's not trying to hurt the church of Laodicea or hurt the church. He loves the church. He loves the church more than I do, more than we He loves the church. He died for the church. This is what he tells them. This is your condition. And he says, I counsel you. How many want God's counsel? If he didn't love us, he wouldn't counsel us. If he didn't love the church of Laodicea, he would have said, I counsel you. And I can tell you this. God is raising up a company of prophetic voices right out of the Citadel Church that are going to counsel, give God's counsel. Not just make you feel good, but give God's counsel. Because without the counsel, I don't know what to do. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. This is, this is amazing. He tells a lukewarm, passive community of believers, I want to make you rich. But you've got to make a purchase. You've got to buy the right gold. Not fool's gold. Not the world's gold. But my gold. The gold we'll find in the fire. The gold that doesn't rust. The gold that doesn't rot. The, the gold that let the treasure, the, 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 the thing that, that glows, the thing that the streets are gold. Which means you've got to buy the word. You've got to, you've got to have the purity of the word. So that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear. Well, you know, not at men's warehouse. So you can cover your shameful nakedness. Listen, I don't want you to walk around in shame. I want you to be covered. Listen to this. I had never seen this before, Pastor Steve, but listen to this. And salve to put on your eyes so you could see. I'm writing my sixth book. I'm in my last chapter. That's in my last chapter. And when I read that, I realized what he's talking about. It's the prophetic ministry. It's the salve that goes on your eyes so you can see. Because without the spirit of prophecy, you cannot see. You can't see the future. You can't see the present. You can't discern the past. You oh, because it's the it's the, it's it's saying I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to a prophetic conference because it's not just about me getting a word to make me feel good about my future. It's about me putting salve on my eyes so I can see my destiny. I can see my purpose. I can reignite my passion. I can believe God for the saving of my prodigal son or my prodigal daughter. I, I could all of a sudden ca capture something. I could, I could get a word. I'm coming out the ark. Come on. I'm building an altar. I'm, I'm sacrificing. I, I'm, putting, I'm, I'm go going in. I'm putting on new wineskins. And then I put salve upon my eyes. Because the problem is we've got so many people walking around with no, their eyes are not anointed. 
Their eyes are defiled by lust, by pornography, by all these things of the world. And guess what? Uh, and they spend too much time defiling their eyes. But I'm here to tell you, in this church, we got salve at this altar. We got salve at this altar that we're going to purchase salve. Why would we do what we do? And because we want people to see their God-given purpose. Because when you see your God-given purpose, this is exactly what happens. When you see your God-given purpose, I remember in Luke 24, when, when they were walking with Jesus, they couldn't recognize him. Are you hearing me? And he's preaching to them from Moses all through the Psalms and the prophets. And then all of a sudden, they tell him, okay, why don't you come over and, and, and eat with us? And then they sit down, and he breaks bread. And as soon as he breaks bread, their eyes are opened. Oh, come on. What, what happened? What happened when he broke the bread? All of a sudden, prophetic vision come on them. All of a sudden, they saw who they were walking with. And they were saw where they were going. They saw where they were leaving, and they saw where they're coming back to. Come on. All of a sudden, they saw the highway, what they were supposed to be on. Come on. And, and, and the Bible says that when he broke the bread, they recognized him, and immediately Jesus disappeared. But guess what those boys did? They didn't sit about and meditate on it. They didn't have a board meeting about what to do. They went back to Jerusalem. Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? And they said in their, in their, to each other, did not our heart burn within us when he explained the scripture to us? Luke 24, 32. Because what God is going to do at the Citadel Church is ignite a burning heart. Ignite a burning heart. See, when God puts a prophetic word on my eyes, something happens. They walk back to Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus is persecuted. No fear. No worry about Romans. No worry about centurion. No worry about, about Sadducees or Pharisees. Not worried whether they're going to go to a cross or not. Jesus is alive. Yeah. We've seen him. Salve on their eyes. So I counsel you to, to, to buy these things, to invest in the prophetic ministry. This is why. This is what he says. Verse 19. Listen to this. It's beautiful. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I notice you rebuke and discipline people, they leave the church. Is that true, Pastor? They're fine when you encourage them and pat them on the back. Great, go, good job. You rebuke and discipline? Rebuke and discipline is a sign of love. It's not a sign of rejection. Not to discipline is a sign of rejection. My son is a better father than I am. I remember them little critters, when they was toddlers, they'd be sitting there, all three of them, and brother and his wife, he's up there playing guitar, and if any, they made any noise, he just looked at them. No iPhone. No toy. They had to go to worship practice for hours. They never messed up. I never ever heard a peep. Then one particular night, I was in Kentucky. Their middle, their, my, my granddaughter, Noah Lonnie, the second one, she must have been four or five years old. She got a hold of her mama's cell phone. And we're up at the altar, and Charlie and Maddie are singing at the altar, and I'm, I'm getting ready to prophesy. What does it say? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a, a Disney movie comes on. All of a sudden, a Frozen movie comes on. There's a song that comes on, and all of a sudden, the whole church hears it. Guess because he turned it up. That was the last time she ever had a cell phone. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, we, God disciplines us because he loves us. Yes. And so at that point now, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. But this verse 20, it took me a few minutes to get there. I'm in, I'm in Honolulu, Pastor. 
I'm getting ready to go to Maui to open up the conference. I'm looking out at the harbor and enjoying the scenery. And God speaks to me. I mean, he speaks to me like I'm talking to you now. And this is what he says. John, what would it look like if you opened the door? What would it look like if you opened the door? And it was out of this particular verse. I wasn't reading it. I was reading Revelation, but I wasn't reading 320. Because here's what 320 says. Because here, think, this is the lukewarm, passive church. And here he says, here I am. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. And all of us, I mean, I know that by heart. I've heard it over and over and over and over again in my Christian walk. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God speaks to me, John, what would it really look like if you opened the door? Because I'm going to tell you something right now. I believe God called the Citadel Church to open the door. I have a call to every single person, what would it look like if you really opened the door to the knock of Jesus? I'm telling you, it don't look like passivity. It don't look like boredom. It doesn't look like it doesn't look like depression. It doesn't look like poverty. It doesn't look it doesn't look like sadness. It doesn't look like death. It doesn't look like sickness. It doesn't look like cancer. When you open the door, you just invited the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over. Which means I want to knock on the door of the lukewarm. I want to knock on the door of the weak. I want to knock on the door of South Tucson. I want them to open the door. He, there is no church that he addressed like that. He told the church of Laodicea, I stand at your door, and I want to come in. I want to come in. We started this church not because we're not busy. It's because Jesus wants to come in the door. Because here's the thing. We've allowed drugs in the door. We've allowed immorality in the door. We've allowed sin in the door. Now it's time to allow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the door. We allowed divorce in the door. We've allowed poverty. We've allowed racism in the door. I'm here to tell you I'm kicking that out. I'm kicking that out, and I'm inviting him in the door. What would it look like? If we really open the door, God asked me that question. Pastor Steve, he asked me that question. John, what would it look like? Because sometimes we think we've opened the door. We might have opened the door to the church. We might have opened the door to religion. We might have even opened the door to being a leader. But have we really opened the door to Jesus? Because when I open the door to Jesus, exile has no power over me. When I open the door to Jesus, guess what? My past doesn't have power over me. My mistakes doesn't have power over me. My insecurity doesn't have power over me. My ADHD, ADD, all capital letters, doesn't have power power over me. My lack of sleep doesn't have power over me. My Starbucks addiction doesn't have power over me. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? Because I've opened the door to him. Now, do you think that Jesus is coming over to eat the food? I'm not that good of a cook. You think he's coming over because he wants to look at the place setting? How well I've set the table. He wants to look at the furniture. He wants to look at the chairs. He wants to look at the tablecloth. Church, sometimes we're so concerned about the tablecloth rather than the fellowship. 
I want to make sure the place setting is perfect. I don't, there's nothing wrong with beauty and excellence. But what happens at the table? What would it look like if Jesus is sitting across the table? I can tell you Jesus is not interested in the steak. Jesus is not interested in what's being served at the table. Jesus is interested in you and he's interested in me. I'm interested in you, son, because I want to ignite something inside of you. Church, you have to understand, I came from very, very large. I'm the least likely individual in that church to be you. I was never on staff. I was never a pastor. But I decided to open the door. And when I opened the door, the ex-con became a prophet. When I opened the door, I opened the door, the little skinny guy picks up people that weigh 300 pounds and twirls them around. Okay, are you hearing what I'm saying? When I open the door, all of a sudden power comes out of my mouth. All of a sudden the God that I'm sitting across from begins to speak to me like I'm speaking to you right now to tell me what to say to people. And all of a sudden, bam, things begin to happen. People get delivered. People get saved all over the world because I open the door. Why can't you open the door? Why would you want to open your door to your boyfriend? Why would you want to open the door to your girlfriend when you can open the door to Jesus? Oh, come on right now. They may steal from you. They may steal your innocent, rob you of all your credit cards. But you open doors to Jesus. I came to make you rich. I came to put eye salve on your eyes. I came to heal you. I came to deliver you. I came to set you free. Open the door. Turn to your neighbor and say, open the door. What would it look like if we really opened the door? I can tell you, sin would taste bad. Defilement, I don't want that. There's nothing else I want. I just want, I just want to sit here and have Nimsy sing all night, you know. Because I'm sitting with Jesus. What if Nimsy never opened the door? What if Nimsy said, I don't have a worship team? What if she didn't open the door and say, I'm going to take a mic, play with the soundtrack, and pray that God shows up? Because when you open the door, he does show up. What if I didn't chart the church? What if I didn't open that door? Oh, I'm not a pastor. I'm a prophet. And I can't do that. According to these leaders, that's too much for me. I can't do both. What if I didn't open that door? What if John would have allowed his exile to shut him up? What if we allow our past? What if we allow our rejection? I'm too, reje I'm too rejected to open the door. I've made too many mistakes in my life. I've made, I've committed too many sins. Jesus asked them to open the door to the one who was full of sin. Because when you open the door, you won't be full of sin anymore. You'll be full of me. I stand at the door and knock. If any man or woman opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. Listen to this. Then he said to the one who is victorious. This is Miliana. He doesn't say this to any other church. The one who is victorious. What victorious over what? Passivity. Pride. The two things that Laodicea had. Passivity and pride. 
the two things that the human soul struggles with. Passivity and pride, lack of passion and pride. When, you, when, when you're victorious over that, because pride says, I don't need you. Pride says, I don't need to come to the altar. Pride says, I don't need to leave my house. Pride says, I don't need to pray. Pride says, I don't need to give. Pride says, oh, come on, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a man, man. I don't do that stuff. I'll let the women do that. You know what was really good news? Sarah said it. We had lunch today. There were more men around the table than women today. We outnumbered them. And not that we're trying to outnumber them, but what it says that we've got men that have opened the door. When all my men will stand up and say, I'm opening the door. I, if I love my family, I'm going to open my door. If I love my wife, I'm going to open the door. If I love my kids, I'm open the door. If I love my grandkids, I'm open the door. If I love my family, I'm opening the door. Come on. Are you hearing me? Because pride and passivity isn't going to hold me. I'm not going to be that macho. Come on. I'm not that macho. I'm macho when I open the door. And let Jesus say, you're wrong, bro. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to get you in line because I want you to serve me. Guess what? Any woman would want to follow that. I don't have to about worry about my wife following me. She'll follow me to Greenland. She'll follow me to Antarctica. If I told her I'm going to start a church in Antarctica, she would say, let's do it, son. If God told you, let's do it. You know why? Because guess what? I opened the door. Oh, Jesus. Listen to this. To the one who is victorious, oh, gosh. I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Wait a minute. You know what that means? Think about this. To sit with me on my throne. Which means I'm going to scoot over. I'm going to scoot over. I'm going to make a special room place to sit with you, that you would sit next to me on my throne, ruling and reigning. <laughs> I'm telling you something. The enemy tries to come and attack me all the time. But guess what? I just get back to my seat. <laughs> I get back to my seat. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I'm above and not, not beneath. Oh, oh, come on. I just. Because the devil will tell me, you don't belong there, son. Look at you. Look at you. Look at you. Look at all your friends. They got nicer churches. They got waterfalls in front of their church. You don't even have a parking lot. You got cactus and weeds in your. <laughs> Scoot over. Scoot over. I'm scooting over. I'm putting a place for you. Do you think you're sitting on the throne just, just to sit there? You're sitting on the throne because God's going to share his authority with you. My God. Was now, guess what? Hey, that means that because you know what? I was victorious over my passivity and my pride. Guess what he'll do? He said, son, what do you think I should do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you help me make decisions. I'm going to let you make some decisions. I'm going to let you rule. I'm going to let you reign. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you, what do you think we should do with South Tucson? Because I don't care who says it. The drug dealer's not over this house. The drug dealer's not over. The government's not over. Jesus is over. He's looking for somebody to sit next to him. I say, oh, God, let it be the Citadel Church. Let it be the Citadel Church that we get in a sit next on the throne. I mean, that's what it says. One who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Pastor Steve, 
if you really think about it, Noah was victorious. What, what, what it was he, he is victorious over culture over that laughed at him. He, he makes a, he builds a boat when they don't have a reference point for a boat, because the earth looked a lot different than it did. There was there was no need for a boat, right? Nobody was sailing at that time, so he built something that he that nobody even has a blueprint from it. Because guess what the Citadel's church is doing? We're going to build something that we don't have a blueprint for. We don't have a blueprint for this. There is no blueprint. It's an original. The problem with the church today is we're making copycats. We want to copy church growth. We want to copy success rather than build an original. Because if you copy, you don't have to sit on the front. You don't have to open the door. I can just open the door to the successful pastor down the street. But if I want an original, I got to open the door to Jesus. I got to be victorious over passivity and pride and let Jesus give me a blueprint to do something that's never been done before and to accomplish something that's never been seen before. Can I hear an amen right now? I, 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 because when, when I, when I, when I, when I looked at, when I looked at others in the body of Christ, I mean the others in the Bible, you know, you, David, who, 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 who wanted to, want, because, you know, nobody could really touch the Ark of the Covenant, you know, and, and so he decides, you know, I'm going to go get the Ark and put it in the middle of Jerusalem. I'm going to build, I'm going to build a, a resting place for God. In Psalm, Psalm 132, I will not sleep or I won't slumber until I build a place for God. You know what? He had no blueprint. He had no blueprint for it. But guess what? Guess what? It was in his heart. And because he sat next to the Lord and was victorious, God says, I'm going to let you bring my presence to Jerusalem. Oh, come on. How many want to bring his presence to South Tucson? How many want to bring his presence to South Tucson? Come on. How many realize that we can overcome? The, the key is we've got to declare war on passivity. Because this body wants to be lazy. I'm going to declare war on passivity. Because the moment I'm passive, I open the door to sin. The most, the most passive people are the most sinful people. Because they open the door to the wrong person. Because the devil's knocking at the door too. He's knocking at the door. He knocked at my door today. He'll knock at my door tomorrow. But guess what I'm going to do? I don't, I, I'm not answering that. I'm not answering that. I'm answering the door because he's going to come in and meet with he, me and with him. Because guess what? Do you know why the Latter of Dean church was in the condition they were? Because they were bored with God. I've heard that message before. I've heard Noah before. I've heard about the new wineskin. And a lot of preachers, they hear the same way. I know where she's going. I know where he's going. They're bored with the word. But when you open the door to Jesus, there's something fresh. You hear something fresh. You see something you never saw before. You experience something you never experienced. Oh, I mean, Pastor Steve and I have to be careful. Because when I call him, I mean, I'd like to call him more. But the problem is when we're on the phone, it's over an hour. But every conversation that we have always comes around circle to something that Jesus is saying to us. Every conversation. Why? Because the word of God is no longer boring. If, the, I mean, if you're sitting here and the word of God is boring, I'm going to tell you, you can't be saved. You can't be. You can't be really saved. Because if you're really saved, you would love his word. You are in love with this word. I can't wait to open it up. I can't wait to find that gold that I'm purchasing. Come on. I can't wait to get that eye salve on my eyes. I can't wait to have this experience so I can see this and hear this, preach this, prophesy that, experience that. I'm ready to open the door. Who are ready to open the door right now? Who's, who's ready to open the door? Lift your hands over all over the house tonight. Father, we love you. Father, we adore you. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet, and it is a light upon our path. 
Father, I'm going to ask you that you would raise up a company of men and women in this place. That there would be every person within the sound of my voice, from the youngest little baby, the cute little grandbaby, to the oldest, to every one of us. Every one of us would open the door. What would it look like? What would this Citadel Church look like if all of us opened the door? What would Jesus Saved International look like if everybody at Jesus Saved in Shafter, California opened the door? What would happen if every leader, every preacher opened the door to Jesus? What would happen to America? What would happen to the earth? What might be imparted if we open the door? What might we experience if we open the door? I can tell you we wouldn't be bored. We would be filled with adventure. There's a song written by a group called What's the name of that group that Brandon part of Meliana? You know who I'm talking about, Brandon Hampton who came here. What's the name of that? What's the name of them, huh? Huh? United Pursuit. One of the, one of the one of the band members wrote a, wrote a song called "Come Away with Me." Come, come away, come away with me. You know what? It, one of the lines says, "It's going to be great. It's going to be wild. It's going to be full of joy." You know what happens when you open the door? It's going to be wild. It's going to be great, but it's going to be full of mayhem. Because here's what we're going to do. I don't want this church to be full of John. Or full of Meliana. Or full of Rob. We'll be in trouble if it's full of me. I want it to be full of him. Full of him. Come away with me. You know that song, son? No, you don't. Praise God. Praise God. I should have gave it to you. But here's what we're going to do. I want everybody to stand all over the room. I want you to stand all over the room. I want you to tell God, God, I want to open the door. Tell God I want to open the door. I want to open the door. Everything that is hindering me from opening the door, I'm, I'm going to remove from my life. I'm going to immerse myself fully in this purpose. I'm going to break pride and passivity off of my life. It's a constant battle, but the more I open the door, the easier it becomes. Because we're going to do something right now. If you're in, here in this room, if you're here in this room and you say, preacher, I'm ready to open the door. I'm ready to open the door. I'm ready to declare war on passivity. I'm ready to declare war on pride. I'm de- ready to declare war on Luke Rip. Lukewarm, shallow Christianity. I don't want to be a part of that. That's why the church in America is powerless. Because it's so shallow. Concerned about the light show. Having smoke coming out. The, uh, and nothing wrong with that. But, but it, what happened to the real smoke? What happened to the real light, the light of the world, the city on a hill? What happened to that? Yeah, we're, we're, one day we're going to build a sanctuary right over there in the middle of that parking lot. Going to seat four or five hundred people. Yeah, it's gonna, that's going to happen. Yeah, we're going to have a wonderful screen and lights and all that. But at the end of the day, if we don't have the light of Jesus, then all we have is a show. Are you hearing me? But here's what's going to happen. We're going to have a group of people that have opened the door when we were 50, 60 people so that when we were five or 600, guess what? The glory of God fills the room because we've opened the door now. We've opened the door. If you're in this room tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm opening the door. I'm making a commitment. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to let Jesus make the right assessment of my life. 
I'm going to let him correct me. I'm going to let him adjust me. I'm going to let him, I'm going to let him be the divine chiropractor that puts my life in alignment. If you're ready to open the door on the count of three, I want you to run to this altar right now. One, two, three. I'm ready to open the door. I'm ready to open the door. I'm ready to open the door. Go ahead, son. Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. Open the floodgates of let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Make it your prayer. Open the floodgates. Make it your prayer. Let it rain, let it rain, open the floodgates of heaven, let it rain, let it Young lady, could you come forward, please? Could you come and stand right here? I want you to lift your hands to Jesus. Pastor Veronica, if you could come over to my right, her left, right on this side, and put your hand upon her heart or shoulder for me and help me. Just come over to my right, her left. Put your hand on her. Congregation, stretch forth your hands to this young lady. I heard the Lord say, when you were standing right over there, I heard the Lord say, you know something about exile. You know something about worshiping in exile. When you've gone through loss, and when you have gone through pain. And the Spirit of God said, I've come in. I've come into your table. There's a lot of unanswered questions that have been revolving around your mind. But I'm here to tell you, You are going to be a voice of healing in this city. A voice that tells people how to worship. That tells people that loss and exile doesn't determine my love for Jesus. And because you've opened the door, and really out of necessity, out of necessity, without him, you'd go crazy. Without him, but you have someone to lean on, someone to argue with, someone who understands you. And the Spirit of the Lord says, you're carrying my gold. You're carrying my ISAB. You're, you're carrying my garments. You are carrying me. And I need you. I, I, I need you to do this. I saw a vision of a wardrobe. And that wardrobe wasn't for you. That wardrobe was to cover the shame of loved ones who are naked because of the choices they made. You will cover them. They 
will come to your house for counsel. That out of your pain, I will give you a prophecy that changes history. Father, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. Touch her right now. In the name of Jesus, there it is. God is touching you right now. Never to be the same again. My brother, come over here. Come over here. Lift your hands to Jesus all over the house. Right. Pastor Steve and Prophet Michael, come over here. Put your hand on his shoulder. It was over 20 years ago. I'm going to be very specific. 21 years ago. If I do my math, that's 2003. You got burned. You got taken. You felt the arrow of rejection. But I've brought you full circle. Because I want to restore you. right now in your life you've tasted passivity and found out it takes you down a road of boredom of lifelessness and God brought you here the last couple of nights and days because he's reigniting your passion he's reigniting your purpose He's reigniting your future. Because because the life was squeezed out of you. It took you a few years to recover from it. To recover economically and recover emotionally. But now you're recovered. And now what I want with you is I want to place a spirit of prophecy on you. So you go around putting your hands on the eyes of the spiritually blind so that they can see the truth and not be deceived. Father, from the top of his head to the sole of my brother's feet. Touch him right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There it is. God is touching you right now. Young lady, Young lady, right here, I met you. Come over here. Young lady, right here. Yes, bring her over here. Vanessa, put your hand on her shoulder. I'm going to tell you something I do not want you to forget. All you wanted was the truth. You're not interested in riches, nor looks. You're interested in truth. Yet, recently, you sat before the Lord, and you said these words. Why do they lie to me like that? 
Why do they lie to me like that? What did I ever do that they would lie to me? I want to give you a word of wisdom. Pride always lies. Humility always tells the truth. Pride tries to impress. Humility serves. And what I'm going to do for you, young lady, is I'm not sending people to you anymore that are going to lie because you're going to discern when they're lying because hands are going to be laid on you. And what's going to happen is real relationship, real love, real commitment, real longevity and sustainability happens when there is an atmosphere of truth without offense. Because that's what you've been looking for. That's what you've been fighting for. Because that is your gold. That is your silver. That is your wealth. Father, from the top of her head to the sole of this young lady's feet, heal her right now. Heal her right now. In the name of Jesus, never to be the same again. Hallelujah. 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 Go ahead, son. Worship God. Worship God. Worship God all over the house. Worship God all over the house. Worship God all over the house. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. Forever, I can sing of your love. Forever, cantaré de tu amor por siempre. Cantaré de tu amor por siempre. Cantaré. everyone to put your hand on your heart, please. I want you to say this after me. Jesus, I understand that passion is crucial. Passion for you. And your kingdom. And your ways. Lord God. Don't let me. Fall into the trap. Of pride and passivity. Father. In the name of Jesus. Let me open the door. And let you in. Let you speak, let you rule, and let you reign. Lord God, I make this confession. I will open the door. In the name of Jesus, amen.
and amen. Give God a shout of praise right now. Give God a shout of praise right now. Give him a shout of praise. Is there a victory shout in the camp right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want you to hold your hands out like this. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for each one. I pray that exile will never hold them. Because there are moments of exile. There's moments of the mountain, there's moments of valley, there's moments of exile. But all these things do not hold us. Just as John told us how to sing, how to prophesy, how to preach in exile. We will fulfill our calling no matter where we're at. Because we're in the spirit. May these people in, within the sound of my voice fulfill their full God-given purpose. God, I make a commitment to you. And I will do everything I can in my power. Because I'm seated next to you to see every one of these people become all that you would have them be. Because we love them, but you love them more. So right now, May we hear the sound. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell three people you look like you're really victorious. Victorious. <laughs> You we'll see you tomorrow night at eight thirty sharp. <laughs>